Attention, students. Um, same headmaster here. It's time to do the show. Uh, do the show. No! 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 Ah! Mm. I, I said, said no! no! I'm going! Don't yell at me. Don't yell at <laughs> What? Did you do that podcast over there? Did you? Mm, mm, uh, mm, I don't I'm know. the definition mm. of calm right now. I, 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 I'm not allowed to go next to the goblet. And welcome to Into the Fold, a show where two best friends share their love of Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse chapter by chapter. I'm Jeff. And I'm Juliana. And this week we are starting a brand new book, Jeff. How exciting is that? Absolutely exciting. Because yeah. this, I just tried to do the math. I did not because I'm not good at it. But I was trying to figure out how long has it been since we actually recorded an actual chapter discussion? Because in December, we released... A uh, book wrap up, which was kind of a discussion of chapters, and we did our winter fate, which was a lot mm -hmm. of fun. Yeah. And then the start of the year, we released the trivia crossover with Sombra y Cuervos that we meant to release earlier. But this is uh, the first time in a long time that we've actually sat down to discuss chapters, and we're starting a new book today. Yeah. It has been such a long time, and I'm really excited to be starting this book too, Jeff, because this is my favorite book as of we where we stand right now out of the original three. From what I remember, which wasn't too long ago when I read these for the first time, this is my favorite book out of the trilogy, and I'm really excited to get started. And I will just say, and we already kind of had a little bit of this discussion, these books start out hot. We're going to hit the ground running, my friends. Oh, yeah. And, and we get to that a little bit in our notes, I think, about how similar it is the way we start off the first book and the way we start off this one. Like, there's going to be this theme of just, okay, you know what? We don't have time to spend the first five chapters of the book setting stuff up and then something happens. Like, something is going to happen right away. Yeah, they were like, action! And then they were like, Bleh! Exactly. Like, if you're filming a movie out of sequence, you start with the shots, I think... I can't remember. It's either you start with the shots you can get out of the way the fastest or you start with the big shots because if you need more time to get them right, then you need to know that immediately. See, I would start with the big shots if I were someone doing a film because that way, because you, I feel like filming a movie is the same thing as building a house. You say it's going to take 10 to 5, oh, sorry, not 10 to 5, good lord. 11 to 12 weeks and it ends up taking 20 to 25 weeks in reality because of all of the pipelines you have to redo and the electrical systems that need redoing, you know. You know. That stuff. Home things. Mm-hmm. But before we get into Siege and Storm, we have a little bit of news. A, a little bit of news. It's the news from the front door. news i didn't even have to ask for it that time that was great jeff no you did in honor of the fact that we're starting a new book today i figured i would do it without asking but oh my god juliana yes oh my god juliana yes, yes. juliana hi oh my god it is me okay first of all i feel the need to clarify something i feel like we've said this before but just it bears repeating mm -hmm. we are aware that based on when we record these things and release them, that when we cover news that's happening in the fandom, people have probably heard these things already. Yeah. Especially this first item. We understand people have heard them. But we need to react very, very strongly to these things. We need to overreact to these mm -hmm. things. We need to react not just over, but from the side a little bit. And maybe below, above, you know, from every angle no, we can possibly No, from below would be underreacting, and this Ooh, is not something true. to underreact to. And do you know why? Why, Jeff? We have casting announcements! Woo! I'm so boo, excited. Boo, 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 boo. See, I didn't even know that they were going to announce the cast. I've completely missed this announcement and this countdown that was apparently happening on Instagram. People had it in their stories after the fact. Didn't even Me say too. it. Me too. Didn't yeah, say it. Me too. I completely missed the countdown. I I I 
you would think that as many different uh, between the two of us you would think that as many Grishaverse accounts as we are now connected yeah. to that we would have been watching this I had no idea that this was going to happen at this point. I did notice that Lee Bardugo was a little bit more, she came back onto her social media for a little bit, but she was only posting pictures of her dog. So I Even so, was something about little, the yeah. re-entry of Lee Bardugo onto social media, you know that something is going to happen. Yeah, I was a little bit like curious as to what was going on i knew that they were going to start filming this very soon and you and i jeff knew that they would have to release the cast at some point around this time because they're starting the filming and things are going to start leaking you know they will that's just how the world works but i didn't know that it was this specific day but i was very promptly on top of this as soon as i found out jeff found out as soon as he woke up from his shift and we were both ecstatic about this casting announcement because what we got jeff is some fabulous casting we got the casting of tolia tom 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 is it tamar tamar tell you what i i've got let's make this fun i yeah. will say the name of the character and then you say the name of the person okay because i have a feeling some of these actor names may be a little bit easier a little bit easier for you to pronounce yeah so you go go ahead jeff who do we get so first up we have Tolia Yulbatar, who we will be meeting in today's chapters, and yes. he will be played by Louis Tan. And Louis is actually s- Tan. Is it Tan? Hot. No, no, no. I was saying he's hot. Oh, he's hot. Oh, yes. Oh, this, this, uh, this is a man who is like constantly en fuego and mm. just smoking at all times. He, he's definitely an attractive, big, bulky, chunky in the best possible way human. And he is the kind of the image I had in my head for Atolia. Oh, they're all perfect. Let's get that right. They are all yeah. exactly. They're they're more than I could have dreamed of. Yeah, honestly, all for these all these people. people. Yeah, they all are just pretty much as we've seen them in people's fan art versions of them and also how I've envisioned them in my own head, which is especially after some other series jeff that we've read and you see the tv show you see the movie and you're like "Ooh, no that was not what i was envisioning this is really nice to have pretty much our imagination brought to real life and maybe that's just a a testament to how well lee bardugo writes her characters that all of us are on the same page because there seem to be quite a lot of people who agree with us in the fact that these are very accurate castings of the characters that we're getting. Mm. I agree. But Louis Tan is going to be playing Tolia Yulbatar. And then we are also going to meet in today's chapters, his twin sister, Tamar Kirbatar, and she will be played by Anna Leong Brophy. Uh, She is actually a fellow podcaster, Jeff. She has her own podcast. Really? Yeah. What's her show? It's a com. It's a come on. Ugh. It's a comedy show where they talk about older movies and TV shows and stuff. And I know they actually did an episode about the Little Mermaid because I was perusing their social media, and I will definitely be giving their show a listen. But it's with a fellow British comedian that she's friends with, so probably hmm. very entertaining. Definitely, probably worth a listen. Probably. And then I'm gonna skip down to this one. We're gonna save. Uh, we're we're Bye. gonna save one for last. Bye. And I'm also going to take a moment to point out to people that at this point, we are going to start deviating slightly from what we have talked about in the books. We didn't really cover this at the top the way we normally would, but today we're talking about Siege and Storm, the before preface, and chapters one and two. So if you're one of the people listening who follows along with us and hasn't read beyond those chapters, then a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today is going to be, at least in this in this opening segment, is going to be stuff that is a little bit of a spoiler. Some of it, not all of it. Yeah, so if you don't want to be spoiled at all, just hang on for a minute and fast forward like maybe a minute and then come back. Hey everybody, Jeff the Editor here. If you are reading along in the books with us and you are not wanting any Six of Crows spoiler content whatsoever, you can go ahead and skip ahead to about 18 and a half minutes, which is where we pick up our discussion for today's chapters. 
So third, we have the young man who will play Wyland Hendricks, because apparently they are going to go ahead and introduce that Six of Crows character at this stage. There was some uh, mystery about whether or not they would go ahead with that, but they are. So who's going to play him? Yeah, he's being played by Jack Wolf, And from what you said, Jeff, he's someone who appeared in The Witcher, correct? He has. And that we didn't really talk about that uh, previous credits with these others, because for most of them, it seems like their credits have been mainly uh, British film and television, some of which has probably crossed over to American audiences. But Louis Tan, for example, um, he's been in a lot of things that people would have seen because he was in Deadpool 2. Uh, I think they did a TV show of Rush Hour I saw that he was a part of somehow. And um, he was the star of uh, the most recent uh, reboot they did of Mortal combat wow so he actually oh, yeah. is a pretty high tier high ranking actor to be getting here and and we have i would seen say that... that of the three of the four of them he has the highest profiled uh resume i would probably say because uh jack wolf here um oh, he's playing wyland hendrix first of all he is cute as a button, which is oh, exactly adorable. what you want for Wylan. He's perfect for that part. And how cool of a name is Jack Wolf? Am I right? With an Even e. if it's a stage name. I don't know if it's a stage name or not. But yeah, Wolf with an E. Oh my God. He probably has to explain that to people. Can you imagine? Like it's Wolf, Wolf with an E. Oh, watch. He's going to get huge off the show. And then he's going to put a little chick over the E. And he's going to say, um, <laughs> excuse me. um, It's actually Jack Wolf. Hey. Yeah, I could definitely see this for him. But you were correct. He is in The Witcher. That's a major credit. Very hot show right now. Yeah, a show that I will be putting on my to-watch list because Jeff recommended it. And so I said, okay. I just started. I'm about four episodes in. But you know what? Even if I wasn't enjoying it, I can see the hype. I get it. Yeah. Well, I'm zero episodes it. in. So you're further along than I am. Well, finally, yes, we have... the most exciting casting announcement we've had to, to date. You have been waiting... I've been waiting. ...for Nikolai Lansov. Yes. And here and he is. He's being played by Patrick Gibson, whom I don't know, but I have been looking through his Instagram and his socials, and he seems to me to be that perfect combination as a person, based off of his social media, of kind of white privilege but nice but also rebellious at the same time which is kind of the exact energy that Nikolai Lancelot kind of puts off like he's like privileged but also is kind of down to earth but also is a bad boy but also is just a nice guy when it comes down to it I love it because I'm looking at the response from the fans and people for the most part seem convinced that he's exactly what they pictured. And the more I think about it, he really does fit the bill of everything I know about Nikolai. But if I'm being honest, my, I don't know if this was ever actually said or not. It may have actually specified something to the contrary, but I always kind of imagined him as being a little bit more dark haired, maybe like, like I picture a darker, haired version of bill weasley like he's got a goatee mm. but he's not gonna grow like full beard like he's got like a ponytail maybe but you know what the thing is we know what these actors look like we know what they look like in other things they've done but we still don't know what they're gonna make these characters look like they could do a lot with hair and makeup yeah, and the thing is, too, with Nikolai, we are going to be getting a Sturmhahn version of him and also a Nikolai version of him. So I like your description, Jeff, for him as Sturmhahn. Mm. Oh, yeah, that could be a disguise. So, like, if he runs into anybody he knows. Yeah, we, we'll, we will see that Nikolai has more than one face that he wears, so I definitely could see your version of him being one of his faces. Oh, yeah. I like that. I mean, all of these castings are very, very excellent. And it was worth the wait. It's some good news. It's still going to be a while before we get the next season of Shadow and Bone. But I have so much joy for what is coming now. Yeah, me too. And I am just hoping that, like with the first season, that this will just bring more people into the fandom with us too as well. So I'm really hoping that it will just draw up the fandom again and get people more engaged and hopefully bring people over to our little corner of the universe and we can share this awesome fandom with them too. Yeah. 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 
But we have one more little piece of news, Jeff. And what is that? Well, people who have been waiting for their podcast apps to update with our newest episode, they may have noticed that we're looking a little bit different these days. Yeah. Why is we... that? Well, I mean, for starters, Jeff, I think green looks good on both of us, you know? We have a new logo! Yes! I don't know if we initially announced this in the first episode or not, but for each book that we do, we are going to be updating the logo to reflect what the book is about. And so for Siege and Storm, as you might have seen on the front of the cover of the American edition, there is a lovely serpent on the front. So we have added a serpent to our logo and we will learn why that serpent is important as we read along but stay tuned for that information as we get to those chapters but we have our new logo so no this is not a separate new podcast it's the same podcast it's just we are moving to a new book and for the people who have read these books as many times as i will say i have julian i think you've read them once and now you're yeah. rereading them for the show mm -hmm. i've read these books many times over if you've read the books as many times as i have then you probably are looking at the logo thinking, hmm, trust me, put a pin in it. We will address that when this comes up. Yeah. But we like it. it it's, it's a fun logo. I yeah. like it. And it's going to update every time we switch books. So yeah. be on the lookout for what our logo is going to turn into. Yeah. I also had to take into account while designing these how, how things looked aesthetically. There are design choices that we could have made that just like wouldn't have looked as cool as this one. So just Very also true. also give us the the benefit of a doubt that we were trying to make it look pretty and also make sense at the same time. And sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds. You know, I stand here in front of you, Jeff, and I am the exact example of that. I am just drop dead gorgeous, but it's hard being this beautiful, you know. Before we move on to our chapter discussions, it's a little bit quieter than usual today, but we're going to talk about the voice, the voice of the people. people. There's not too much happening in the voice of the people. I think because we just had two episodes where there it was like little smaller bits of feedback. Well, we had a great response for our winter fate, but all of that was incorporated into the episode as well as our wrap up for shadow and bone but yeah. for the episode we released most recently in case you missed it we recorded a trivia crossover with uh danny and lucero from sombra y cuervos and we have that up now that was supposed to release as a bonus episode earlier and it was supposed to have come out at the end of last year but since it didn't we just decided that that would be our episode to start off the year so to everybody who participated in the trivia along with us, thank you for that. Hope you had fun with it, and we hope you enjoyed our crossover. Yeah, we had a really fun time recording with Danny and Lucero, and we'll be doing a trivia event for each book that we read, and so look forward to that, everyone. And again, from me as well, too. Thank you for everyone who participated on our social media, who interacted with us and answered the trivia as well. That was fun to play along with you all. Super fun. So let's kick off these chapters with our before preface, just like we started off Shadow and Bone. We have Alina and Mal, and once again, we're referring to them as the boy and the girl, and they are on a Kirch trading ship trying to make the best of their situation. The sailors are very impressed with Mal because he has a lot of skills that they find useful, but Alina makes them nervous because she's very quiet and not really talking to anybody or doing much. She's just kind of haunting the ship like a ghost. And Alina's having nightmares that are getting progressively worse, especially the ones about the Darkling referred to as him, but by the time they make land in Novia Zem, all they want is to be safe and to be able to find a home. Yeah, all perfectly reasonable wants, needs, and desires. I don't know how you feel about these beginning segments, Jeff, but I really actually prefer the first person segments that we get from the rest of the book, which yeah. it, it really hit me hard when we, because we haven't read through a beginning or before section. Like we said, we haven't done a chapter read for a while, and reading this first and then jumping into chapter one i was like jumping into like a nice cold bath of water on chapter one and being like ah, 
that was what I wanted. I didn't want this prologue shenanigans, really, when I started. I could have just done without it, honestly. Well, I mean, we talked about this with Shadow and Bone, how this is going to become a thing. The before yeah. section, they're referred to as the boy and the girl, and they were a boy and a girl in that one. And then they did it again with the uh, epilogue after. And here I think we're going to see that again. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue. But we talked about also how it's something that you try out stylistically as a writer that it Mm -hmm. changes over time. And without giving too much away, she likes to begin these books with something that still fits in with what's going on. But the way that she eases you back into this universe, it's connected and yet it's its own thing. So I like the idea of having a preface and an epilogue to ease you back into and out of it, just in case there's going to be this huge gap between books, especially Mm -hmm. if you're reading them when they first come out. But I think as far as calling them the boy and the girl, it feels to me like she's trying to write them as if they were these artistic short stories that could exist on their own, but still fit in with what's happening. See... I like the idea of a preface, but I feel like in my head, what I would prefer, you know, when some authors, they do like a letter that's written to either the audience or another character within the book from a certain character. I feel like it would be interesting to get a letter that maybe Alina tried to write to Jenya or someone that at the end, she, we realize that she's not actually going to send it, but it just tells us everything that's happening here, but it's from her perspective too, or like Mal's writing to someone or the Darkling is writing to himself because that's the only person that matters in his life is him. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Dear Darkling, I'm uh... here today and I'm doing fabulous things. I look great. I decorated today. I also I'm started my new laying of feeling makeup. gorgeous. Yes. How do you look? You look good. How do you feel? I feel good. How do you look? I look good. I'm looking good and feel good. I imagine the Darkling has a whole playlist of songs that are on the same wavelength of that. And I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy. I feel like he has a, so- a whole playlist of songs that are like that exact vibe. Like hyping himself up for his next drag review playlist. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I feel like it would be very heavy on, I don't know why, but it would be very, very heavy on Ariana Grande. Why does it seem like Ariana Grande would be a huge vibe for uh, Darkling the Drag Queen? I could definitely see, the, if the Darkling has a Christmas album that he does, he's definitely singing Santa Baby. Santa Baby. Does he really care? I feel like because I think Ariana has those riffs. I think that's what it's like very darkling as because it's so extra to be like, ah, ah, like that's so extra and that's so darkling too. I also thought it was kind of funny. You pointed out uh, like, what if it was a letter that Alina wrote to Jenya, but then she decided not to send it. And I was like, that's a little on the- considering what's coming up in these chapters. That's a little bit ironic, don't you think? Well, I think that it, I, I personally actually would really like that because I feel like then you would really feel this this action we're going to get in the next chapters like even harder when it comes to it. Like you would really like emotionally feel it like even heavier. And I feel like that would actually um, actually really enhance the story. I'm kind of tempted to now go like write this letter from Alina to Jenya that she crumples up at the end and leaves on the Kirch border or something. Oh yeah, if you write that, we're definitely going to we're going to put that out. Yeah, or if anyone else anyone else out there writes fan fiction and wants to take a stab at it, please go for it. Well, we'd love to read it here on the show. But uh one other thought that I had about this I just I don't know. It definitely is a little bit sexist all the roles and everything that are happening on this ship specifically. We'll see more of these roles being broken as well, we of course as we get onto other ships, but well, I mean, think about th- this is a very uh, each of these places that we have everywhere we've been in these books, especially so far, has been very patriarchal, very gender role specified. Everything, at least in a lot of these, uh, the more uh, the 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 I guess you could say the average people, and but we've seen average people, we've seen a military, we've seen people on a ship, we have seen a literal patriarchy we've seen a monarchy we've seen all these environments that 
are run by men. They're controlled by men. And yeah. these men don't want women coming in and trying to change anything because they have to believe that the world works the way they think it does so that nothing ever has to change and they don't have to give up one ounce of power. This seems vaguely familiar to the reality that we live in now. I feel like it's a reality we have always that has never not been here. Yeah. Which, which is sucks. why we need books like this where uh, kick ass girls are kicking ass and the stories are being told by kick ass female authors. Yes. And female identifying people tear the patriarchy down. I mean, if I could do anything before I die, I would really love to do that. That would be great. Someone just like... It's a worthy goal. Okay. Any closing thoughts on the before section, Jeff? Yes, my closing thought on the before section is that the before section is closed and we should talk about chapter one. The yeah! first chapter. The first the chapter. The first proper chapter. Yes. So. What happens in it? So in this chapter, Mal and Alina are in Crofton and Novi Zem, and they are living their best lives, quote unquote, aka working any job they can find and literally staying at the whole hostel, also known as the average experience of every modern modern twenty something. Alina gets lost easily, and Mal finds her while girls fawn over him and show him their boobs. Not One day, really. <laughs> I mean, they're spilling out of their shirts, Jeff. They they're are, just... but I don't want. Like people to think <laughs> I don't want people to think this is a dirty book. It's not. It's not dirty. It's not dirty. They're just spilling Sorry, out of shit. Continue. Shirts. And then one day when they come home from work, they get set they get some shifty looks and weird feelings in the pits of their stomachs. And then surprise! It's the duckling and he's here to say hello. And he's fabulous. He's sitting in the nastiest chair ever, but he is just working it like no one's business. I mean, what else would we expect at this point? The duckling is here for Alina, but he uses Mal's life on the line as a way to get Alina to do as he wants. And Alina says, no, thank you. And says, let there be light. The duckling is here with a new toy. This new toy is a bunch of mean shadow monsters that bite Alina in the shoulder. And then she is out. Like a light. <laughs> like a light. Hee <laughs> hee she, <laughs> she tries to light things up and then it's like, boom. Yeah, no. Yeah, funny. I mean, I know that we've talked about, you mentioned before about how it's better when these circumstances are just directly from the point of view of the characters. And I yeah. agree. Because we've talked about here before how it's how much you get attached to the characters and how much... You're just, they become important to you. So you want to see things from their experience. Yeah. And it just makes it more personal too. I would have been very interested, at least if we were going to try something different. Like if I'm her editor for Siege and Storm and we're going to try something a little bit different, I might pitch the idea, okay, how about this time we try doing the first chapter. We start with the first chapter and we make it like a preface, but we do it from Mal's point of view because Alina, everything she says, like she describes what's happening and then she's paranoid. And then she describes something else that has been going on and how it makes her paranoid. And then by the end of the chapter, her paranoia is completely justified because, I mean, she has been traumatized mm -hmm. a lot by many people, yes. so her paranoia is a perfectly understandable symptom of what she has endured and is continuing to do endure. But it would be interesting to know if internally is Mal as worried and on his guard as Alina is. Yeah, I actually would like to have that chapter, and I definitely feel like that would have been a much better introduction or even just a substitute for this chapter because... First off, that's a view that we haven't even gotten to see at all up until this point in these books, aside from that weird letter that's at the end of the book, of book one of the American edition. But I definitely agree with you, Jeff, and I think that this would be a really cool thing to get. So if you want to write it, Jeff, or if you, people out there want to write this POV of Mal in this chapter, like I'd love to read that. 
Right. That's exactly what I need is another project because I don't have enough of those. No, neither one of us have enough projects. We just need more people. Just give us more things to be doing. Please and thank you. I can never have too many things. What is sleep? I don't know what that is. Nope. Not existent. This is, think, is an interesting question, and it's even more interesting because you're the one who asked this. Yes. Is Mal really that hot? Yeah. Like, why are these people really that attractive to him? Like, is he literally the only person with a penis in the entirety of this town? I mean, what? Do, first of all, what does attractive even mean? There's no accounting for taste. Some people think that what you would call a dad bod is sexy. Some people think that you have to be perfectly cut with not an ounce of fat on you in order to be sexy. Because trust me, I have seen a wide variety of different types of people and getting to know them, I have learned that what they find attractive or unattractive is a huge, huge bank of diversity. So is Mal objectively hot? Like to most people, in this environment, in this age, I would say yes, because it's not just his features or his body, it's what he can clearly demonstrate. Like, think back to all the useful things that he was able to do on the ship. Mm, He's strong, he's capable, he can provide, and based on his physique and his presence, uh, you mentioned the, the lady who was literally spilling out of her top trying to get her mal to notice her instead i mean she's probably going to be wanting some kids and i have a feeling since that's obviously very important to a lot of people especially in this situation that Mm -hmm. he would he would father probably many kids i think he's got that in him you know what's sexy jeff what is sexy juliana being a capable human being and i think at this point mal mal is kind of exuding and i hate to admit this but he's exuding those vibes of being a capable human being so i think you're right i think that's that's what these women are looking for because i mean most women for the most part aren't super sold on looks alone but if you like clean my kitchen or clean my bathroom or go grocery shopping for me that is sexy look I dated women, okay? I'm married to the best one that I've ever met. I've dated men. I've dated and been involved with a lot of different kinds of people, and there is superficial people all over. That's Mm -hmm. not a thing that any one gender identity or sexuality has any kind of monopoly on. The superficial people are just superficial people. And Mal, although he may be, as you love to put it, a douche canoe, at least he's not a superficial douche canoe because he proves to, he, he brushes this lady off with absolutely zero hesitation. He's not tempted by her in the least bit. Yeah. And that just makes me feel better about mal i feel like these wait what did you say wait till hold for the text jeff i feel like these two chapters that we get right now well actually specifically more this chapter than the next chapter because we'll you'll find out why in the next chapter but uh actually make me feel okay about him like i don't hate him in these two chapters oh my god I think my brain just stopped. I don't, think no, don't hang hold on, on to that on. for too long I, I'm, I'm because getting, like we're no, not I'm getting even getting a news to the text point from where... from the BBC World News. <laughs> Apparently, hell just froze over. <laughs> I wonder if these two things could be connected. You know, I am reading Percy Jackson and the and the Olympians, so I have a pretty strong Canadian connection with Hades right now. So th- they might be related. Just mm-hmm. saying, just throwing that one out there into the ether. Hades and I were kind of like biffles for life, you know? But just just a, just a humble brag. They, they There are rumors going around that the Darkling survived in this chapter. There's rumors going around that he's building up his army again. And I have a theory about this. Yes. The Darkling is the one putting these rumors out. Because who else would do it? He would have to have orchestrated this. He's either letting himself be glimpsed, which is him, by extension, putting the rumors out, or he is telling all the people who are still loyal to him, I want you to go out and I want you to just, like, 
like he says to Ivan, Ivan, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go into town. You're going to order a drink. You're going to start up a conversation and you're going to say, so has anybody seen or heard anything? Because I've actually, I, I heard the Darkling was, was seen not that far from here. I find only one flaw in your plan, Jeff. What? Ivan could not be that subtle. There's no way the Darkling sent Ivan out to do it. He could send Fenrir out to do it. But there's no way Ivan's walking into a bar and be like, hey, did you hear the Darkling? He'll walk into a bar and be like, the Darkling is coming. Hello. <laughs> That's fair. That is that is that is a, that is an apt analysis of Ivan. <laughs> Fenrir, I feel like, would be too far the other way. He would be walking into a bar and he'd be like, okay, so Agrisha walks into a bar. And, and it's here me. he is. And it's me. Because I just did it. <laughs> yeah, hi. And uh, then he, he'd be like five drinks in and be like, I love everyone. Yeah. And then Kesha starts playing on the jukebox because both Kesha and jukeboxes ex- exist in this universe now. Yeah. I need them too so that I can be right about this. I think I, I'm here for it. It is now canon, Jeff. Can I tell you another fan theory that I have? And I sure. wonder if you can find a... You found a brilliant flaw in my last theory. Here's my next one. Mm-hmm. The reason Jurda is legal, apart from the fact that this whole world is constantly at war and it has practical applications for the military, mm-hmm. is that there are no obvious withdrawal symptoms if you stop using it. It's like caffeine. Like You might feel it a little yeah. bit. You might get some headaches or your body may react to it if it's used to having that in your system a lot, but it's not going to be like, it's not as addictive as certain things mm-hmm. and it's not going to mess you up as much if you go through withdrawals of it and that's why it's legal. I can agree with that. I can definitely agree with that. I would also like to say that Jurda seems to be like water, and especially Novi Zem. Everyone just has it on them. They just chew it and have it at all points of at time, and everyone's mouths must be orange. Yeah. Literally, everyone must just have an orange mouth, because the amount that these people chew is ridiculous. I would really... So, I agree with you that it's legal because there probably are no overt deadly or really terrible withdrawal symptoms but i would love to see what would happen if someone did not supply this whole community with jurda for like a week because (laughs) they all seem so addicted to it and i'm sure their energy levels are just so that they're so used to chewing it all the time would the whole town just like sleep for a week because they wouldn't be able to function on their own what do you think it's an interesting question now that I think could be an interesting fan fiction, mm-hmm. the town without Jurda, like that's a title. Somebody can have that for free because, like I said, I have too many projects to get involved in writing another fan fiction unless it was for a very special <laughs> circumstance. Yeah, but that would be interesting. I would love to read that. So calling it chewable super coffee, not as catchy as calling it Jurda. No. They do have coffee. They have coffee, right? In this universe, have we seen people with coffee? I think we saw them with coffee. It's, I think I, I have don't... a feeling coffee shows up in like Six of Crows for some reason. It might. Hmm. hmm. Listeners, stay tuned to see if coffee is mentioned in these books. I know you're all just on the edge of your seats being like, are they going to mention coffee in these books? I must know. Is it a dark roast or a light roast? A decaf mm-hmm. or a regular? Do they take it with cream or do they take it black? Every, all the questions that everyone is just being, like, waiting to hear the answers to. But, Jeff, I think the next thing we need to address is the Darkling, because... He's here. I, and he, he, he is, is making it very apparent that he is here and he is working that chair that he is sitting on like his life depends on it he has to flex so hard and that is just how that's how it's how extra he is and how petty he is because he can't just snatch them off the street take them to a ship or anything no he has to be waiting for them in the place they think they're gonna be safe because it's where they're sleeping even if it is a ship hole and he has to make all of these really articulate 
impassioned, unnecessary remarks. He has to yeah. he has to make them that they may have built themselves up thinking they were safe. He has to bring them back down again. He has to re-lower them just for the joy of doing it. I have a strong feeling that when Alina and Mal see the Darkling, first they feel fear, and then inside of them they think, oh no, this is going to take like a full hour to get to the point where he is going to tell us what is going to happen now, because every single time we interact with this man, it's just, he has an expose that he wants to give us, and why is there always, why is everything just like a, a freaking dissertation on his life? Like the uh, Prichniki who are with him, as soon as he starts pontificating, they're like, okay, guys, we're going to be here for at least a solid 45 minutes while he explains why we're here. So everybody just go ahead and pull out your phones, smoke them if you got them. And one of them, like maybe Ivan, because he's the one who's organized, like he keeps, he's got his Facebook open because he's checking Facebook or Mm -hmm. he's got his app open where he's checking on his Rovkin investments. And he's every now and then scrolling over to his Google Doc he's got for like, like their hostage taking plan and he's scrolling through the bullet points to see where the darkling is and he's like <laughs> nudging people's like okay guys he's almost to the end of paragraph one here i know it's been like 20 minutes but we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're getting there i have a strong feeling that ivan's also checking his tinder while he's on his phone oh yeah he's definitely he's, de- <laughs> he's, he's rolling he's... his eyes at all the unsolicited you know what picks that he's getting mm-hmm. because some people they just don't on that app not that i would know not that I would have any reason to know, not that I've ever been anywhere near anybody who has used those apps, but some of them, I've used it's apps. just, it's like some secret code for, hey, how's it going? They don't even type, hey, how's it going? Just, yeah, I don't, I don't, there need, it to, is. I don't need to see any pictures of anything but your face before, before you even say hello to me. I'm pretty sure we have listeners who don't need to hear this. Yeah. But I have a strong feeling to check it. I have a feeling also that the Oprichniki have invested in some really nice invisible AirPods. So that way, as soon as the Darkling goes off, they can be like, okay, now it's time to listen to some nice, some some real artistry. And they all turn on Ariana Grande and they all listen to Ariana Grande for like 20 minutes. Because that's what the Darkling makes them listen to. Yeah. Well, yeah. they have to rehearse their musical numbers in their in their heads before the actual musical number as well. The Darkling is doing his speech. They listen to their songs and they're like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, eight, one, two. And they rehearse their dance moves that they know they're going to have to do later for the Darkling's music video. Oh, for sure. (laughs) It makes me a little bit sad, but also it just kind of proves how strong of a villain the Darkling is that he's done this before. He has made this threat to end Mal's life before. And Alina, at this point, probably knows the Darkling as well as anybody. Even in the short amount of time they had together, compared to how long he spent with other people, she knows him. She knows that if he really follows through on killing Mal, then she's not going to have, she's not even going to have the will or the strength to do anything to him or for him. It just, that's going to be the end of it. But all he has to do is threaten Mal's life and she will do whatever he says. Yeah. Yeah. The Darkling knows how to play the piano that is Alina's willpower and brain. And Mm. Mal is definitely the key that he needs to play to get Alina to do what he wants. And he knows that. And he's just going to use this this little bit of leverage that he has and really just roll with it hard. He has an interesting line where he says that he's referring to the amplifier on her neck. We haven't even talked about the fact that this amplifier is still attached to her permanently. So God only knows how she's sleeping, poor kid. But he he makes the point that the amplifier she's wearing is his after all. And uh, yeah. we talked a little bit about uh, Grisha theory of how amplifiers actually work. Not that we get many answers, but he killed the stag. David mm-hmm. fashioned the amplifier around her body so that it would amplify her power. So I have to wonder, what percentage of this company does each of them actually own this amplifier? Like, is it 60% hers because it's on her body and she's the one using it, but 40% his because he used, he he did Mm. the action that led to the destruction of the stag? 
You know, that's a very good question, Jeff. Because, like, obviously, can I, I can't recall now. Can he force her to use her power with the amplifier? I think he has some control over that, from what I'm remembering. And we're going to get more into that as we go forward in the books. We'll see more of that dynamic. Fair enough. But, but I think I think the answer is yes to an extent. I'm also hoping we get an answer. Speaking of Risha theory, I'm hoping we get an answer on exactly how Alina's attack on the Darkling led to the creation of these Nichivoya. Because yeah. we're going to find out a little bit more about what they can do and how they affect the Darkling when they are called into service. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious, it, like her using her power to attack the Darkling, how did it create? Like a combination of her ability and his ability trying not to use the word magic here but there's no magic in this universe yeah they don't call it magic we know that but this combination of these two things leading to the creation of what appears to be solid matter which according to alina they're not supposed to be able to do yeah i i i don't i don't know i'm trying to do that math in my head too because these are clearly like very dark shadow creatures but maybe the combination of the darkling's shadow powers and his lust for vengeance and her hatred towards him combined in a very negative creature and being that has just all of the negativity of hate and vengeance spun into it potentially that's my best theory that's all i got it's interesting makes as much sense as anything else i think yeah I mean, we we don't really know unless Lee Bardugo tells us, so. Like, maybe anybody who's listening might have thoughts. Like, if you guys have any theories about whether or not people can function without Jurdo once they've had some, or Mm -hmm. whether or not this combination of powers leading to the creation of Nichivoya makes any sense, like, anything that you guys have to say about this stuff, let us know. Like, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Full fan fictions and everything. If you write it to full fan fiction, we're not going to read it here on the show, but we will personally read it and write a... What will you write, Jeff? Summary! Yeah. That's what... Yeah. Nice. Speaking <laughs> of summaries, I've got one for chapter two. You want to hear it? Yeah, I'd love to hear a summary, Jeff. So, we talked about a lot in the first chapter. At the end of it, Alina and Mal have no choice but to surrender to the Darkling and his crew. And she slips in and out of consciousness and really messed up dreams for what adds up to about a week. And by the time she finally fully regains consciousness, they are on a ship. And guess who's back? Back again. Jenya's back. She's a friend. Not really, but we'll get to it. Jenya's there, and she's trying to take care of Alina, and she's wearing Ethereal-Kai colors instead of wearing white. That's important. The ship that they're on is a whaler, and the ship is captained by a legendary privateer, don't call him a pirate, by the name of Sturmhand. He's been hired by the Darkling, and this leads to a, it's frankly to me, it's hilarious, this exchange of power between the Darkling and Sturmhond about who's really in charge here. And the only members of the crew that we really get to meet are two of my most favorite people in this entire fictional universe, and it will become very clear as we get through these books why that is. We meet Tolia and Tamar, who are brother and sister mercenaries from the Shu Han. While they're being held captive, Alina tries to appeal to Sturmhan to let them go, but he appears unmoved because he is motivated by money and fueled by jokes. My kind of guy. Yeah. Except for the motivated by money part, but I'll forgive him that. Jenya proves that she's still completely brainwashed by the Darkling by trying to make excuses about why he's not so bad and she doesn't regret her choices, and then drives the final nail in her and Alina's friendship coffin by admitting that she stopped the letters Alina and Mel were trying to exchange with each other. Bad, Jenya. Bad, 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 bad. Not cool. This chapter proves that the Darkling really understands what it takes to be a megalomaniac. Because you have to find somebody's weakness and you have to exploit it to the point that you completely dominate them and strip them of their willpower and you just force them 
to do whatever you want and take away their autonomy. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much exactly what he does. He pretty much strips Alina of any autonomy that she has as a person in any capacity. And genuinely, this chapter, on the whole, the beginning part, essentially, just really makes my stomach sour and makes me really, really, really upset as to how the Darkling is treating Alina. And just thinking, like, if that was me, if I was Alina, I... If I woke up, I would be even more ripped than she is when she wakes up. Granted, she is very drained in her energy, and that's a big thing, too, because she hasn't really moved for a full week, and her heart rate, I'm sure her muscles are just trash, because the blood flow to them has been probably almost non-existent for a full week, which is not okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, they have a heart render, at least one, who has been making sure that she stays unconscious so that she can heal and <laughs> recover. So they're probably doing the best they can to control the flow of blood through the rest of her body so that her muscles won't atrophy too much. I don't think they're actually doing that to make her heal, though. She's just, I, in my head, this is, she is being put under to sedate her so that way they can get her back to... The little palace and then why didn't they keep her under the entire journey until she was back at the little palace why wake her up now probably just so the darkly can flex he felt like he wanted to flex and he was like ah oh, today is a good day to go flexing so since he feels like he's in charge of this operation probably not trying to sedate her just to keep her from making trouble until they get back or he would have done that I don't know. I just don't I just don't think they're healing her while she's asleep though. Well, they're not doing a good job of healing her. Yeah. I don't know. I just think there's no healing involved at all. I think they literally are just like this soup will keep her functional until we wake her up whenever that is, whenever we decide that is. And we're just going to leave her here and uh someone can watch her if she fully stops breathing, someone please uh resuscitate her and that that is all, folks. Jen is the one who keeps trying to give her this soup. So we don't know for absolute certain, but it would make sense to me that she would be not so much doing it against orders or behind the Darkling's back, but she would just be deciding for herself, you know what, I got to give this girl some soup or she's going to waste away. Because yeah. Jenya is the ultimate both sides of the issue character for me. Like she's the kind yeah. of character who really keeps me able to see both sides of an issue because on the one hand was it terrible what she did to Alina to break their friendship yes is she completely brainwashed by a megalomaniac in a big way yeah. is she making regrettable decisions of course she is but on the other hand she has been horribly horribly abused and yeah. even though she's really trying not to accept that part of that abuse has been because the Darkling made it so? At least the physical aspect of the abuse. The emotional mm -hmm. abuse, I think, is more from the Darkling than the King, but the physical abuse is definitely from the King, and the Darkling played a part yeah. in that. We've, we've yeah. established that. Mm -hmm. But in, on, an, on the other hand, she really wants to believe things are going to be okay, things are going to get better, that she's on the side of right. Because the moment she acknowledges that she's not on the side of right and this person she's invested so much of her heart and her time in is leading her astray and not actually looking after her, she's going to fall apart like a house of matches. Yeah. She's definitely living in that zone of denial. Of just not wanting to accept. She knows what she's doing. And I think she's consciously clocking it. But also putting in that box of. Well think about it later. <laughs> we have things to be doing. We will, we will address this later. And sometimes Jeff. That box gets filled with too many things. And then it overflows. And then there are problems. Oh yes it does. Because that box does not have elastic walls. That expand with no. the more stuff you put in it. It is no. a finite area. It's made of cardboard. You know, you know what? It is made of cardboard. Because with cardboard, yeah. a lot of times, even if it's stiff and rigid and inflexible at first, the more you stuff it and the more you cram stuff into it and the less you take care of it correctly, it's going to ruin the structural integrity of the cardboard and eventually it's going to rip. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's Perfect. a cardboard box. 
you have made a brilliant metaphor here today. Thank you. You know, it's my only life goal is to just make metaphors. Why don't we switch gears for just a moment and talk about something a little bit more positive. <sighs> Juliana's favorite character. Let's talk about a certain character wow. whom you love dearly. Wow. I, I love him as well for good reason. But let's hear about why you enjoy him in this chapter specifically. We get to meet him. We see his personality. And just tell me what you love. I I love Sturmhond. He is perfect. He is sassy. He has a comeback for everything. He is just on top of things. He is running the situation. He's running the world. He is just one sassy mother that I freaking love. And I think he is so funny. And I would love to exude this energy in my life. Thank you very much. Valid reasons. Just a few that I thought of. That I mean, I thought some of the things that I put down are things that you you summed up very well. I appreciate. I, I mentioned earlier he's motivated by money, and that I myself am not motivated by money. But I appreciate that he is in this case because he's not motivated by emotions or yeah. empathy. If you and at this point, what I see from this character, just based on what's in this chapter, is what you see is what you get, which considering where the character goes is an interesting first observation. But when I first met mm. the character of Sturmhund, I remember thinking this is a what you see is what you get kind of character. If you hire him to do a job, he will quote you a price because he knows what he's worth. You will pay him that price because he's not going to negotiate down for anybody. And then he will deliver the results because he will not let anybody find out that he couldn't do the job. Yeah. He's reliable. He's blunt. He's honest, as far as we know him as this Sturmhond and character person. And I I love a blunt character, Jeff. I love a character who tells us exactly how it is. This is great. I feel like he's kind of exuding that same energy that Bagra does, where she just tells you exactly what's on her mind exactly it's so fascinating though that he goes by what is obviously a nickname and he deflects any personal questions so he won't tell you a truth about himself but he'll tell you the truth about you because yes. he's good he's obviously good at reading people which i imagine in his line of work is very important because yeah. you're going to have to probably work with a lot of different people. You're probably going to lose a lot of good folks. You're probably going to end up having to rehire all the time. Mm -hmm. And so going by a nickname, not wanting to answer any direct questions about himself, but not being afraid to hurl things back at people. He obviously understands his business and he knows how to conduct it. And yeah. And, and, slight yeah. segue into these two individuals we're going to talk about in just a second here. But the fact that these two shoe mercenaries who are on his crew, that one of them is a woman. Yeah. We've talked about how part of the reason the people on the ship that Mal and Alina were on at the top of the book, part of the reason they didn't want Alina around, and it says so in the text, that they didn't like the idea of having a woman on their ship. They don't yep. want her emotions to get in the way. They don't want her to challenge the way that things are. They don't want to have to constantly be looking after her when they're supposed to be doing man stuff. But here you have this sassy, clever privateer who can match wits with anybody, and he's got a crew that includes a bad woman. Yeah. And two people That's from right. the shoe, two toughies from the shoe Han, just like... My favorite character, Botkin. Botkin. Oh, yes. I'm not going to give anything away, but it's possible that these characters might cross paths and it might <laughs> make my heart melt. Just a little bit. But Tolia and Tamar, you knew. I mean, we don't get a ton from them in this chapter. We meet them. We mm -hmm. see them. We get descriptions of them. They keep mentioning the eyes. Yeah. See, to me, that is very important because on a positive side, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about casting these characters for television, they needed to cast people who have beautiful eyes, and they have. Yeah, they do. And golden eyes, they said. So this Mm -hmm. makes me wonder, for the Netflix show, are they going to put them in contacts? I kind of hope so, because that would make them even more striking as people. And both of these actors are both very beautiful people to begin with. So I feel like that would give them that extra little edge that makes them seem, dare I say, magical in a way. Yeah. So I I could definitely see that happening. I I would support that decision. Now help me out with something here. This yeah. uh does it mention in the text that having golden eyes specifically is a shoe thing or is it just something that these two seem to share in common because I don't hmm. recall them mentioning Botkin having golden eyes. Yeah, I think it from what I'm remembering, I don't remember anyone else from the shoe being identified as this and because they are brother and sister, it could just be a family trait that they share. It could be Highly, highly, highly likely. But, Jeff, I have another feeling that I would like to share. Tell me what that feeling is. I want to hear it. F*** you, Ivan. Yeah, Ivan. you, f*** you, f*** you, f*** you. Seriously. Hang on. Who is it? Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. There was a message at the door. It says, Dear Ivan, f*** you. Sincerely, us. (laughs) He's just a terrible human being. I understand that he is under the tutelage of the Darkling, but he's just a terrible human being. He's just a terrible human being. Do you think he'll remain one? Because he's obviously, he's very strict, disciplined, inflexible, not wanting to be in any way kind, follows the Darkling's every word. He's he's an enforcer. Oh, yeah. He 100%. is the enforcer for the Darkling, and he is not nice. Yep. And I wonder if that's just where they're going to keep going with him until he probably ends up dying. Possibly. You know what, Jeff? I genuinely can't remember what happens to Ivan. And I, from where I stand right now with someone who, one, has read these books but can't remember what happens to Ivan, and two, for the sake of our listeners, has only read up to this point. I can't see Ivan changing his ways anytime soon going forward. So I'm going to say that I think the latter of what you said, that he's just going to stick with the Darkling until he dies from some kind of incident that happens. Because he seems to be on the Darkling train all the way to the last stop. I have to say I agree. I also agree that I I don't remember either exactly what... Um, his fate is like where he ends up specifically and when I said him dying that's just based on me reading a lot of books like this Mm -hmm. where they establish characters that whether you love or hate them by the time the final showdown actually goes down that rhymed that most of these folks are going to end up dead especially the ones who have the strictest most clearly defined personalities and goals They either achieve their goal, their goal changes, or by the end of it, they just end up dying. I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't think Ivan dying is going to be a loss to anyone. If he died, I don't think so either. It's not going to, especially if he died soon. Yeah. Before anybody has a chance to see the good in him and want to save it. Knock, knock, chapter three. This is Juliana. May I please request that we kill Ivan in chapter three? Okay, thank you. Thank you, chapter three. I think killing him in chapter three would be immature. And that comes from uh, my knowledge of watching Game of Thrones. You don't just introduce somebody that people don't particularly care for and then kill them. You introduce somebody that people don't care for. You keep them alive so that the desire to have that character destroyed is even stronger. And in the meantime, you kill off a bunch of characters that people actually like. And then by the end, that character ends up dead. But not too soon because the payoff is so much bigger if they put it off. I'm not going to start naming Game of Thrones characters that suffer a fate like that, but they exist they're out there good point but you know i won't i won't be sad if he dies anytime soon i will not be grieving any losses my friends so this last point that you have here uh 
about Sturmhund um, not doing more sooner. What exactly do you mean? Yeah, so as we see in this chapter, Sturmhan and Te- to- Toya and Tamar wake Alina up like midway through potentially the week that she is knocked out because she has this memory of them. And it's like he's trying to talk to her about something maybe, maybe wake her up, but then has to put her back down because the Darkling or Ivan or someone is coming and they don't want to get caught. But clearly Sturmhan has some kind of leverage over the Darkling as we see when she actually wakes up and their interactions. So I was just wondering why Sturmhan didn't insert himself sooner into the situation to get her woken up. Because this seems like something that he would not want to be happening on his ship. Like a girl who is completely unconscious and has no autonomy for herself just kind of sitting on his ship. Probably because his curiosity got the better of him. Because, I mean, I've established that, to me, Sturmhand, at least my first impression of him, is that he's a guy who just does the job. But he's not without his curiosities. He knows who the Darkling is. He knows yeah. what he's capable of. And he may not know everything the Darkling wants to do, but he knows that it's probably something major. And he probably just couldn't help resisting the temptation to talk to Alina. Because yeah. we still don't know, like, over the next couple of chapters, they haven't yet established by the end of chapter two exactly, specifically, precisely what the Darkling's next move is mm-hmm. and how Sturmhan factors into it. We just know that he needed a way of transporting Alina so that they wouldn't lose her again and so that people wouldn't make a big deal about the fact that the Darkling has definitely decided to return the Sun Summoner, I would imagine, to Ravka. Mm-hmm. So I think it's because curiosity probably got the better of him while he is deciding exactly how much he wants to insert himself into what's going on here. Because all we know about Sturmhand is that he's been hired to transport the Darkling and his team and Alina and Mal to wherever they're going for whatever they're doing. So we don't know who he really is. We don't know if he has ulterior motives here. We don't know. But if he is trying to communicate with her in the middle of her being knocked out, it's probably because he's at least curious Mm -hmm. about where this is all going and whether or not Alina might be able to give him a clue. That could help him decide what his next move is. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. That definitely makes sense, Jeff. But... That is the end of chapters one, two, and before. Any closing thoughts, comments, concerns, anything, Jeff, that you would like to say before we head on into the fun segment? Assuming the position of somebody who hadn't read further than this yet, Mm -hmm. I would expect that in the next two chapters, something big is going to happen. Like bigger than the Darkling showing up again and taking Alina and Mal onto a hostage ship. Something big, uh, like a huge, one of the hugest, I would say, parts Mm. of this book is probably going to happen in the next two chapters. So we'll see if I'm right when we get to chapters three and four. What about you? Closing thoughts? I'm just glad that we got to meet Sturmhand and I, I salute him and I would like to say that I love him. So that's all. We have certainly met some characters that are going to become big, wonderful favorites going forward. Very exciting. Hey, Juliana, guess what time it is? It's game o'clock. It's game o'clock. We're going to play a game for our fun segment. You want to know what it is? Oh, what game are we playing? Well, we're going to play a game that you may be familiar with, but Mm -hmm. we're going to give it a fun name that has to do with this universe so that it feels like there's a good reason why we're playing it. This game is called Two Bagras and an Apparat. So how are we going to play this game? Well, you've played Two Truths and a Lie before, haven't you? I have. So we're going to do that. I'm going to give you three things about me, two of which are Bagras, they are bold truths, and Uh one of which is an apparat, because it's a stinky lie. And you are going to tell me which one you think it is. Okay. Okay. So here are three things about me. Number one, I own six instruments. Number two, 
I was in a band in college. Number three, I am a Seattle Seahawks fan. You may ask me one question about each thing, and let me know if you need me to repeat them. List the six instruments that you own. List the six instruments that I own? Yes. And if they have a name, I would like their name too. So like Bob the guitar or like whatever. Okay. One is an acoustic guitar named Laverne. Mm -hmm. Two of them are electric guitars. One is a red one called Scarlet. My wife named that one. The other is a green one named Russell. Mm -hmm. I have a synthesizer. I have a ukulele. Mm -hmm. And I have a violin. Okay. What was the name of your band? The name of my band was Amendment. Okay. What was your last statement? I am a Seattle Seahawks fan. How did you start beco- how did you become a Seattle Seahawks fan? When I decided to start watching football, I decided to pick a team and follow them because if I tried to follow all the teams at once, it was going to give me a migraine. Yeah. So I picked them because I'd heard a lot at that point about how they were doing well, how their quarterback is a good person and how they had some of the best players. And I'm very fond of that part of the country, Seattle, Washington, even though I've never actually visited it, I would very much like to. So I figured of all the teams I could pick to follow, they just seemed like a solid choice. And I like their mascot. I like their colors. They do have nice colors. So this is what I'm going to say, Jeff. I am like 99% sure that that last statement about about the Seahawks is correct, because I feel like we've had that conversation before. I didn't like how much you paused when you had to remember the name of your band. That kind of is making me question things. I have Mm -hmm. a strong feeling you actually might have more than six instruments. So I'm going to say that the six instruments is the apparatus here. You're going to say that the six instruments is the lie. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid you're wrong. Oh, was it the band? Uh, It was the band. And (sighs) now, see, I knew the Seahawks thing was real. Ah, ha, ha. See, here's the thing. The apparat is a person who doesn't necessarily tell you a lie, but sometimes he tells a lie by omitting certain truths. Now, I did a little bit of both of those things. You see, Uh I was in a band, and the band was called Amendment, but what I said was, I was in a band in college. I was in that band in high school. You may now get angry with me for a technicality if you like. Hey, I at least knew one of those was correct. I, 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 I'm proud of myself for being a good friend, Jeff, and remembering these random things that you tell me. So I remember the story about the Seahawks. So I remembered that one. And I, I knew that Laverne was your guitar. So mm-hmm. I'm proud of myself on that one, you know. But okay, I, you told me to prep these ahead of time, Jeff, and I did not. But I have a few in my head that I think I can probably roll with. So okay. let's see where, where we're going to go with this. So I own less than 15 physical DVDs. Okay. My second statement. My mother's middle name is Julia. Okay. And my third statement is that the only place out of the United States I've ever been is Canada. Okay. So now I can ask questions. Yeah, you get one for each one for each one. You said you have less than 15 DVDs. How many are there? Well, I have all the Harry Potter ones, but I don't know how many there are. I don't have very many. That's a collection. So that one's like four DVDs. And then I have the two Fantastic Beasts. And then I have the Little Mermaid. So probably like 11. Okay. I would say. You said your mother's middle name is Julie. Julia. Does the fact that her middle name is Julia and your name is Juliana have anything to do with each other? They do. That's my grandmother's name, which is her mother. What was it? My name is, her name is Julia Ann. And so my name is actually a combination of my Nana's name, which is Julia, obviously Julia. And then repeat the last, you said the only place outside the U.S. you've ever been is Canada? Correct. Why did you go to Canada? Uh, Once for Niagara Falls and once to go up through it to get to my cousins in Michigan. Okay. 
Hmm. This is tricky. But I'm going to guess Canada is the is the apparat. You think I've been somewhere else besides Canada that's not the United States? I don't think you've been outside the United States. Oh, okay. So you don't think I've been anywhere? Okay. Not outside the United States, no. So I'll tell you what, Jeff. What? You're wrong. I am? The apparatus, the DVDs, I definitely own more than 15 DVDs. Like, I don't own, oh, like, okay. I definitely See, don't own as many as you, but I own at least, like, <laughs> 20 or 30 DVDs, but not not less than 15. Plus, I have the edition of Harry Potter. I lied. I have the edition of Harry Potter where each one, it's in the, it's in the little compact container, but each one has its own DVD plus its own bonus DVD. So that has 16 DVDs in it just straight out the gate. So oh, wow. I definitely have more than 15. Uh, okay, you got mom, me. My mom's the, middle the, name the is name, Julia. Though. I was I was very very sure that the mid, that the name yeah. thing that sounded like something we've talked about. Yeah. Well, I think we've talked about the fact that my grandmother her name is Julia Ann and my name is Juliana and they just combined her two names to make mine. Um, but I actually I the only other, I've only ever been to Canada. I outside of the United States, the one time to go to my aunt's place in Michigan we went up and over visited a few Tim Hortons came back and stopped at the <laughs> at Niagara Falls on the way back and then when my ex-boyfriend Steve and I went we went to New York and then we went to Niagara Falls for like a few days on the Canadian side so very nice hey I've been up to Canada eh? hey hey so you and I both failed Lost. at this game but it was fun because yeah. we learned about each other and our listeners learned about us too I think it's more fun when you get them wrong because then it just makes the game more interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for thinking of that, Jeff. That was very clever. Our last segment we have is our question of the week, which actually comes from like two episodes ago at this point, because that's the last time we actually talked about a book chapter. And the question was, how many chapters do you think it will take for the Darkling to find Alina? And the answer was just one. He finds her in the first chapter. He does. And you know, what's interesting is that I misinterpreted what you meant by this question. Because what you say is, how many chapters will it take for the Darkling to find Alina? Not how many... That that sounds to me like you're asking, how many chapters do you think it's going to take? Which is an opinion kind of thing or like a guessing kind of thing, but not like a here's an answer, do you know what it is? Like, Yeah, I kind of wanted people to guess though, because I knew we were going to do at least one episode that wasn't going to be a chapter reread so i figured hey they can guess now and we'll see if their guesses are correct later on well why didn't you say how many chapters does it take for the darkling to find alina i don't know english grammar english can't be hard for you it's the only language you actually are required to know legally Uh, words are not my strong suit sometimes so that's probably why i wasn't thinking through the exact wording of that so i am not a copyright editor do not hire me to copy edit any of your items because i will do a very crappy job how many people got it right bookworm our friend okay so we had an answer from our friend Allie who said three chapters she was wrong and then we have yael who said two chapters also wrong and then we had a really nice comment from messy vanessi that i won't read here but she said that she was playing catch up on our episodes and was excited to listen to these episodes so we hope that you're caught up messy vanessi we're happy to have you. But no one answered correctly. Not a single person. Nice tries, though. What's our next question? So this is a metaphysical question. This is a thought question. This is the question that you may ponder over and chewing your own brain. But my question to everyone is, would you chew Jerda? It comes with like a caffeine rush, but also really orangey yellow teeth. Is this something that you would like for yourself? Let us know. If you feel like really getting into this, like the ups and downs of chewing Jerda, then by all means, just go off. Like, we want to know if this stuff was on the market, how popular would it be? Yeah. Would you be the poster child for Jerda? Would you sign on to their ad campaign? Would you be an influencer on their Instagram for them? Let us know. Maybe we'll start a fake Jerda company and you can be an influencer on that. (laughs) That would actually be really, really funny. For sure. DM us on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email at intothefoldpod at gmail.com and let us know if Jerda is something that you would get into. Yes. And 
as we mentioned a little bit earlier, our next episode will be of Siege and Storm, chapters three and four. So go ahead and try and read those chapters before we get to that episode. And if not, we will be providing summaries. But listeners, thank you for joining us today. And if you would like to listen to any more episodes of this podcast or just hit replay on us, you can listen to us anywhere where pods are cast. And you can also check us out over on YouTube. And we mentioned our socials. If you want to get in on the conversation, check out the posts that we have been sharing. Anything else that we have to talk about with you guys will be over on our Twitter and our Instagram at Into the Fold Pod. And you can also send us an email with your dissertation on Jurda or your letter from Alina to Jenya that she crumples up and leaves on the feared and border at into the full pod at gmail.com. And if you want to do something nice to brighten our day and make us smile, you could leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts so that we can read it here on the show and let everybody know what a wonderful person you are. There is also a rating system now over on Spotify. It is, as I understand it, star-based only, no comments. But if we happen to see a high average star rating on Spotify, that would also make us smile. Thank you, listeners, for listening, and until next time, we will see you in the fold! Oh god, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have just I should have just after the clapping, I should have just started the show. Why didn't I just start the show? So third, we have the young man who will play Wylan Hendrix. There was some mystery about whether or not yeah. since they're starting to include the Six of Crows canon into the Shadow and Phone Shadow and Phone. Oh my gosh. Hello, Shadow Hello. and Bone here. Yeah, uh, uh, Phantom okay. News here calling Hello. on the telephone because it's the 1980s when people still call each other on the oh. telephone. Well, oh. can, you, can you connect me? Uh, uh, can you connect me to my friend, uh, Jack Wolf? He, he's a playing Wylan Hendrix, and I'd like to use the switchboard to switch on over to him, please. Disconnected. Okay. Oh, no. Alexa perfectly timed that. Did you hear that? <laughs> mm-hmm. What did she play? I don't know. For me. I didn't even say her name. I don't know what happened. Darling, you die. You should turn me. off the Alexa. music because oh. it's copywritten and we'll get it's off, Jeff. into trouble. It, it probably is, but that's a high school music Pretty song. Pretty sure. That's a high school musical two song. Oh, that does not strengthen your argument at all. <laughs> That gives you no leg to stand on at all. Well, currently I'm standing on two, but you know, culturally, sensitivity-wise, no, it does not. Okay, so. The boy on a girl. Oh, my God. I mean, Why am I bad at this? Technically speaking, they are No. We... Okay. They love each other, Jeff. When a man loves a woman. Would you just not... Give me the talk <laughs> right now. I could give it to Bob. Bob, would you like the talk? No, look at the no, look at his wide, innocent eyes. And then the Darkling is here with a brand new toy to try out on Alina. That sounds wrong. Speaking, Speaking of, of summary, just a little bit, just a uh, little bit, yeah, just a little bit. Summertime, it's a vacation. What time is it? Party time. It's about to be throat punch o'clock. I can't punch you in the throat from this far away, but like, I'm gonna, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna draw a fist <laughs> on a sticky note and mail it to you and tell you to just like stick it just below your chin. And then I'm gonna send you back a sticky note that says, BTW, your lip gloss is so not glossy anymore. Hair flip. If you don't write hair flip on the back, I'm going to be a personally upset. <laughs> Juliana is walking around her apartment looking for clues. 
Trying to come up with stuff to lie about Cause that's what friendship is Juliana is walking around her apartment She's looking for stuff that she can lie about Because dishonesty is how you play this game And dishonesty is important to a friendship